So let me come back to this slide. Uh, let me talk a little bit about the machine that we are using today. Um, I just recently got it as a Christmas gift from my wife. Uh, actually, it was a Thanksgiving gift from my wife. Uh, it's basically a Core i5 with uh, 6 megabytes of L2 cache. 64-bit capable, of course. It has 6 GB RAM. Um, for the last few years, all of the latest and greatest processors produced both by Intel and AMD have WTX and AMD Wii, both competing but very similar technologies offered by both vendors, which are Intel and AMD, uh, are basically available. And that's needed. You need to set that up in the BIOS in order to do what we're doing today. You can download and item, I'm sorry. One additional item I think is worth mentioning. If you have a machine that has uh, got a CPU prior to year 2010, uh, hyper-threading is not very database friendly, but starting in 2010 with the latest and greatest versions of hyper-threading with Intel, it is now okay and actually advisable to turn the hyper-threading on if you have it. Thanks, Bert, and that's exactly what I'm doing. I have two physical processors hyper-threaded to emulate four. So I basically four emulated CPUs uh, with 6 GB of RAM. The hard drive is 5,400 RPM, so that's kind of a little bit of a bottleneck. Uh, it's, it's 640 GB in size. So that was a little bit about the machine that we're using today. So if you have a modern comparable laptop, uh, you can use it to set up what we're doing today. This machine uh, is a Dell Inspiron. Um, official list price, if you buy it at Dell, is about $1,100, but you can get it on eBay for about $675. That's what I paid, including shipping. So. Also, um, a reminder that we are taking questions throughout the length of the session, so please type your questions in the chat box, and we'll be glad to take them through the length. We're, we're not restricting ourselves to the questions at the end, so. Maybe the audience who attended the first session. Oh, a few people have already started putting questions in the question box. Um, yep. Yeah, one thing, I'm, uh, Tariq, I'm pretty sure I just want to just check with you before I type an answer to this. Hamant was asking, um, I, I'm pretty sure you started the grid installer as the Oracle user, even for the clusterware, right? Or do you, or do you start it as grid? Absolutely. So the, the other, one of the other questions I see, where's the manual? You can download the manual at brainsurface.com. It's a pretty comprehensive guide. It takes you through all the steps uh, at some points in pretty good level of microscopic detail. So even if you're a newbie and you're doing this for the very first time and you have very little knowledge of uh, Linux, for example, you can still take it step by step and implement it from A to Z. Three main, uh, four main media packs that you have to download and install from eDelivery.oracle.com. All of them you can download from eDelivery, the exception being the Linux part, which has a forward slash Linux. So uh, you can download that from edelivery.oracle.com forward slash Linux. It is recommended, although not it's not mandatory or required, to package these media packs as ISO files. So you can present them as virtual DVD uh, media. Uh, all of them are more than 640 megs, so all of them are DVD, uh, fall within the DVD category uh, at, to the virtual machines. Before quick I go, go to the next to slide, oh, go ahead. I was going to just make one quick addition. Um, E-delivery um, is the best place to get your sources from. That does require a support agreement with Oracle um, and, and a currently active account with them um, to download the database binaries. Um, you can download Linux from E-delivery as well, and uh, Oracle Enterprise Linux you can. Uh, to download the database binaries requires a support agreement. You can also download the the clusterware uh, media pack binaries from Oracle Technology Network or OTN, which is at the Oracle website, oracle.com. When you download those, it's a it's a different packaging. It comes in a zip file, or it just it 
it's slightly different. It's also in a zip file on eDelivery, but it's a slightly different packaging. And uh, that is under the uh, a different licensing arrangement, um, but it is still available. It's I, I've never compared to see if they're exactly the same bits. Um, I've used both of them before, and they both work well. If you want to just do testing on your laptop, you can probably just download from Tech, TechNet as well. But if you're doing anything with uh, your company's live system, you need to make sure to get everything from eDelivery. Thanks, Jeremy. Okay, I'm going to give you a quick overview of Oracle VM VirtualBox and the infrastructure that we've set up, the virtual infrastructure that we've set up that's needed to set up, install, configure this two-node VRAC cluster. Basically, it's two machines, one at the top and one at the bottom, uh, named BSF or Brain Surface Rack 01 and 02. Short names, although you can have longer names as as supported by the underlying operating system, but short names, good um, configuration practice, if you will. Now, because both of these machines are on, I cannot show you the settings, but you have a summary on the right-hand side. This is VM VirtualBox 4 and has an enhanced GUI. It shows a lot more stuff than version 3.x. So each one of these two v, uh, virtual guest OEL or Oracle Unbreakable Linux 5.5 x86-64, uh, both of them are 64-bit machines, have two GB of RAM each. Now if you have a beefier machine than mine, if you have like 8 GB, it would be highly recommended to have like 3 or 4 GB uh, worth of RAM. The main, one of the main uh, in the virtual world, one of the main constraints is is memory. It, I mean, you can have as many machines as you want, constrained by the amount of physical memory that you have on your host system. Also, work, VM VirtualBox is not a Type One hypervisor. It's a Type Two, which basically means that it resides not on bare metal hardware, but on a host operating system. In my case, in our case here today, it's uh, Windows 7 Home Premium, so it's like factory package right from Dell. I didn't not, I didn't change anything as far as the OS is concerned. Um, so it's perfectly compatible to be installed uh, on Windows, Solaris, and Linux. All major flavors are supported by VM Worship Box. It has a 30 gig virtual hard drive and six shared or emulated shared hard drives associated both of these machines. As you can see in the middle, in the storage pane here on the right side. The hard drive can be lesser in size. It can be as less as maybe 15 gig if you're, if you're constrained by space, but it would be nice if you have, I, the reason I have a larger, relatively larger hard drive or, or virtual hard drive for my guest VMs is because I've given it a bigger chunk of the swap space. It has about 10 GB. So if if the physical memory, the, the, the virtual physical memory runs out, it can start swapping basically. It has two virtual bridged network interface cards, one serving as the public interface, the other one as the private interface where the uh, private cluster network interconnect which we did talk about in the first session. And let me go back in real quick, check on the status. A couple of items I can add on the hardware here. I've actually sure. done this with each of the nodes having as little as one gigabyte. It's slow, but it will work because I've had some of my people I work with say, our notebook only has three gigs, you can pare it down. Uh, another thing is, some people will say, well, I don't want to use the shared storage because that's not going to mimic how I might do it in real life, in which case I use OpenFiler, which is a uh, iSCSI solution, and that works beautifully with RAC. Uh, you just have to have a third virtual machine up. And the final note is, I've got people who try doing everything we're doing here, and they will have the virtual machines sitting on a USG drive 
maybe their notebook has a small drive and they just take a USB drive with them. Don't do it. The performance across the USB when trying to run this is horrible. Do eSOTA if you have to have it external, but USB is going to make your life miserable. I tried it once on a USB drive, and I had a lot of trouble with that. Uh, I, there are USB drives, I think. Uh, the thumb drives, the performance can be very different from one manufacturer to another, and I don't know who the good, fast manufacturers are, but when I tried it on a thumb drive, it was not good performance. I totally agree with you. I've had um, similar bad experiences on external hard drives, although that may be the only case that certain people might find themselves in because the physical hard drive that they have is, is, not, is not sufficient to set up a two-node rack cluster. But doing so, like setting up the external, hooking up the external USB hard drive or even like a USB tool or firewire will will still result result in a degrade, degrade, degradation of performance. So it is progressing. Okay, uh, let's go back. Tariq, I was saying this to you just the other day too. I was at UKOUG recently and talked to a couple people, and a lot of people who do presentations at conferences now will run will do exactly this. They have on their laptop a rack environment up and running. I mean, I saw lots of people doing this. The, in my experience, the biggest bottleneck usually is the hard drive. That's the slowest component, and you're sharing the hard drive between two virtual machines. Um, what I saw a few people doing at UKOUG, and I think this is becoming more popular, is you can buy uh, a solid-state disk for a laptop. It's a snap-in replacement for your hard drive in your laptop. It's, it's a little bit of money to do that, but the performance benefits are huge if you use this sort of thing a lot. If you, if you want to do a lot of testing on it, if you want to try a lot of different things out, it, it can work quite nicely to do that. Jeremy, I'm glad you brought that up because I actually do use SSD on my notebook. Uh, and you're right, it is much faster, but you have to be, uh, two things you have to make sure of. The SSD drive that you purchased has to support what's called the trim command. and a lot of times, most of them do, but you have to update the firmware on the SSD drive to get that to work. And the other thing is, you have to be an operating system that supports the trim command. Now, Linux, all the flavors support it. On Windows, you have to be on Windows 7. If you're on anything less than Windows 7, it's not going to support the trim command, and it gets very inefficient to do uh, certain I.O. operations if it doesn't support trim. That's T-R-I-M. Trim? Yes, sir. Thanks, uh, thanks, uh, Bert and Jeremy. So moving on, first step of the process after you've downloaded and created your virtual or your physical ISO files, you can use a, a freeware utility called ImageBurn to basically unzip all the file contents from the media pack that you download and package it into an ISO file without burning it to your to your DVD media. So that's like a neat little thing that you can do. 